Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, we will start with a new module now, okay. uh, we have already seen the constitutive equations. The next module is on default the processing maps. Okay. Uh, so, for a practicing engineer who is on the shop floor who is uh, actually looking after the production, okay, if I tell him all about this dynamic recrystallization, dynamic recovery, the flow stress, okay, it, if it looks like this. Uh, and this will be the mechanism okay and in this temperature range or strain rate you have to you have to do the deformation or the processing he he will not enjoy this particular uh, idea okay that you are coming with all this flow stress because he has to look after the production okay he doesn't have time for all this uh, niceties and uh, your enthusiasm for dynamic recrystallization dynamic recovery Okay, he wants to have a, a very clear answer that if uh, he is uh, designing a process, okay, which uh, temperature, strain, strain rate uh, he should be working in, what will be the flow stresses okay, and which are the region where he will be able to get a good processing. Okay, that means, you will have uh, maybe a recrystallized microstructure that is what we usually like to have. And, uh, which regions to avoid okay maybe in some regions you will be getting uh, some uh, there may be some crack formation or some other defects which are going to uh, come or which are going to be present in the material okay so which regions to avoid okay and which regions are the regions to for 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 the processing okay so you you, you must have seen a large number of places we use these kind of maps to clearly bring out uh, and in engineering okay practice where do pre engineers do practice okay actually do the work okay they want to have this kind of maps where clearly you can demarket okay this is my process processing region okay uh, and usually all the like graphical means are always better for example in our stress analysis also we use more circle okay because a graphical representation very quickly bring out the main uh, idea behind the behind a particular uh, aspect for example in a stress analysis or uh, as we are saying in case of processing maps okay so the this maps are uh, very very convenient for a practicing engineer to identify the processing conditions okay now as I was trying to tell you that uh, uh, what regions to to do the processing and what regions to avoid. Okay. If you look at any plastic deformation or during a hot deformation or thermomechanical processing, okay, the main uh, uh, our main objective is that I should be able to deform it without any difficulty and I should be able to avoid any failure which uh, in the material okay there should not be any defects in the material. So, there uh, this is what we call as workability that I should be able to work on my material okay. So, their workability also can be kind of uh, defined in two ways okay one is called extrinsic workability which depends on the state of stress okay that whether it is a uniaxial deformation, it is biaxial deformation, it is plain strain deformation. Okay, so what kind of deformation it is? Okay, whether it is a shear deformation. Okay, so one workability depends on that. Okay, whether it is triaxial deformation. So severity of the deformation increases as you go from uniaxial to biaxial to triaxial. Okay, and of course you can also have more chances of introducing defects okay uh, whereas in shear process you can go to very high strains without uh, introducing defects okay for example uh, surface cracks and so on 
okay wherein whereas in compression you can easily introduce surface cracks if you are doing a large deformation so this is a extrinsic workability of the material which depends on the state of stress okay what type of stress system is there plane strain plane stress compression shear and so on okay the intrinsic workability is the inherent characteristic of a material okay and that depends of course on the constitutive behavior of material that what is the material's response to in terms of flow stress to, uh, its response as a function of strain strain rate and temperature so that is the intrinsic workability that is of course uh, material specific property okay that how material behaves under a certain set of conditions okay and that will be intimately related with the deformation processes which takes place during this deformation okay at particular deformation conditions so the response uh, the flow stress response can be then also looked as the microstructural response okay that what will be the response of the material so microstructural response also we can uh, segregate the response in two categories one is what we desire okay and one which is uh, undesirable okay so dynamic recrystallization dynamic recovery these type of uh, microstructural response is desirable okay because it gives and uh, it, it enhances the workability of the material you are able to deform the material as you can see uh, as in dynamic recovery dynamic recrystallization you if you reach the steady state okay there is no change in the flow stress as a function of a strain so it is a, a steady state condition you are able to deform to larger uh, strains okay ductility will be more okay so these this uh, uh, particular region we want to work in okay undesirable undesirable microstructural response are the introduction of defects okay so so damage instability like adiabatic shear bands cavitation cracking okay this we should not we don't want in the material because if crack is there in the material or cavity is there in the material it will bring down the strength of the material okay as you know in fracture mechanics a crack if a crack is there it it when i am applying uh, any tensile stress it it will start propagating and your material will fail after some time okay so there will always be a problem of failure of material if you have any defects in the material so again as we were discussing in the constitutive equation that the constitutive equation idea all started from the creep deformation okay and creep uh, already i have told you the, the creep is a very slow deformation as a function of time okay time dependent deformation okay in which the strain rate of deformation is very low 10 to the power minus 8 to i think 10 to the power minus 5 that is the window we decided for creep okay just to kind of recap it that is the strain rate we reach okay and creep is basically your time dependent deformation okay and in this case actually you don't apply uh, you don't apply the strain rate but you apply a constant load okay so you apply a constant load or you can say stress okay and the material response is seen in form of strain rate okay so slightly different than the hot deformation processes where you apply strain rate and you see the material response in form of stress here we apply a constant load or stress and we see the material response in in terms of strain rate okay that how fast the strain is being accumulated in the material as a function of time okay so constitutive equation also i told you at that time that the creep is the first phenomena which people looked at for developing constitutive equation similarly the this map idea also started from the creep deformation only okay so already we have discussed in creep that you have a dislocation creep you have diffusional creep diffusional creep also we have harper your never a hearing creep nh creep or you have uh, cobble creep okay nh creep is dependent on the diff diffusion through lattice okay 
whereas uh, uh, cobal creep is dependent on the diffusion through grain boundaries. So, you have this different uh, type of uh, creep processes. So, I want to know that okay, we at which temperature uh, st uh, stress condition which particular process will be the dominant process. Okay. So, uh, M F H B was the first guy who proposed this kind of maps and he they used to call it as deformation mechanism map. Okay that what mechanism which deformation mechanism is operating at a particular temperature stress condition okay, that they are trying to identify on a map. And the deformation mechanism maps were plotted uh, on, a, on, a, on a graph okay, where you have normalized stress and homologous temperature. Okay. Uh, I do not know whether I have told you homologous temperatures uh, if I express the temperature in this form. Okay. The deformation temperature is divided by the melting point or uh, temperature of melting uh, of that particular material. So, you are actually normalizing it. Okay. So, when you do something like this, it is called homologous temperature. And what maps show? Maps show area of dominance of a particular creep mechanism. Okay. So, in particular area which mechanism is dominating that the map will be able to tell you. Okay, so, this uh, map sh will look something like this okay, uh, where you on the x axis you have homologous temperature T by T m. So, now you can say see it is from 0 to 1 obviously. So, all the different materials can be clubbed together when you do something like this and on the y axis you have uh, stress okay, which is normalized by the shear modulus. Okay. Uh, on the top you can see this is my theoretical strength. Okay. So, if you have done in your uh, mechanical behavior course or strength of material course, okay, uh, theoretical strength you can calculate uh, for a material okay, which is usually uh, scales with the shear modulus. Okay. So, if, if you see the usually I am just putting a parameter uh, some number here. Okay. So, usually it is in this range G by 10, okay, the shear modulus divided by 10 that will be your theoretical strength. Okay. So, that is my line 10 to the power minus 1 okay, because G by 10 is normalized by G. Okay, so, it will be 10 to the power minus 1 okay. uh, and uh, then there are different mechanisms as you can see are identified here. Okay. So, this is the higher strain rate lower temperature okay you can see higher strain rates lower temperatures okay so temperature is going down here and stress is going up here okay you can see that dislocation glide which is the normally deformation mechanism at lower temperature will dominate okay up to a certain temperature okay so from very low temperature to a certain temperature your dislocation glide is the deformation mechanism Okay, as you go to lower strain rate and higher temperatures. Okay. So, in this case now you are going to lower stresses and higher temperatures. Okay. As you are going there, you will see that the creep deformation is starting to dominate okay. and in that also you have different type of creep mechanism. Okay. In this region you have a dislocation creep. Okay, this is your low temperature creep okay, and this is your HT is your high temperature creep okay, through diffusion mechanism and up somewhere here you have a dislocation creep mechanism. Okay. As you could go to even lower strain rates okay, and of course, still at higher temperatures your diffusional creep will start dominating. Okay. As you can see at lower stresses the cobalt creep which is a grain boundary diffusion process and NH creep which is the lattice diffusion. So, lattice diffusion will obviously be even at higher temperature because you for lattice diffusion you need vacancies okay, and vacancy concentration increases exponentially with temperature. Okay, so, you need more vacancies for uh, diffusion. So, grain boundary is already have lot of uh, because of the disorder you have lot of open area where the diffusion can take place very easily without creation of vacancies. 
So, that dominates at lower temperature at higher temperature when the vacancy concentration increases exponentially you start having the lattice diffusion. So, you can see that as you are going to lower stresses higher temperature diffusional creep is taking place still higher temperature, but slightly higher stresses you will start having dislocation creep. Okay. Even uh, higher uh, lower temperature and higher stresses you will have dislocation glide. Okay. So, you can see that all the different mechanisms are nicely shown on a single map. Okay. So, what these regions are doing is from the map we can read off the dominant deformation mechanism as we are doing it and th these boundaries okay, between two deformation mechanisms are obtained by equating pairs of constitutive equations. Again you can see that constitutive equations are coming here. So, you have one constitutive equation for NH creep we have already seen that we have one constitutive equation for cobalt creep. Okay. So, you will see that when the strain rate predicted by these two constitutive equations, okay, when they have equal contribution, okay, the strain rates are matching for both these processes, there we will say that a boundary is there between the two. So, at the boundary you have equal contribution from cobalt creep and NH creep. Okay. So, strain rates are same for both the constitutive equation from both the constitutive equation, but as you go to higher temperatures you will start seeing that the strain rate predicted by NH creep is higher than the strain rate pre predicted by cobalt creep. Whereas, if you go to lower temperature strain rate predicted by cobalt creep is higher than the strain rate predicted by the NH creep. So, th that is how you can have the demarcation between the two processes. Okay. So, again you can see that constitutive equations are used to demarcate the, uh, the region okay. and of course, this kind of demarcation will be highly dependent on the accuracy of your constitutive equation. Okay. So, of, obviously, at the, these boundaries uh, okay, where two different uh, mechanisms are operating, okay, their contribution will be equal to the strain rate. Okay. So, this is what I was trying to tell you. So, I can easily read out the, the, the deformation mechanism okay, and I can easily find out that which deformation mechanism is operating in which particular area. Now, uh, there, there was another addition to this deformation mechanism map. Okay. They started also superimposing the strain rate on these maps. Okay. So, you can see that the strain rates are very low for lower uh, lower stresses, okay. uh, but as you are increasing the temperature the strain rates are going towards uh, higher values. Okay. So, this is uh, if you are not able to see this is 10 to the power minus 10, 10 to the power minus 9, 10 to the power minus 8 and you as you can see that as, as I am increasing the, the applied stress the strain rate is increasing. So, this is 1 per second here. Okay, so, strain rates are increasing. So, th so, these strain rates are superimposed on the on the deformation mechanism map. Okay, so, and, and of course, these are also uh, plotted using only uh, all the constitutive equations. Okay, so, constitutive equation for different regions were used to develop this uh, strain rate contours. Uh, you can see the effect of uh, different deformation mechanism also. So, wherever the boundary is the, the there is a change in the slope of the this is strain rate contours. Okay. You can see there is a sharp change here, okay. similarly a sharp change here. Okay. So, wherever there is a change in the in the deformation mechanism you see a change in the uh, slope of the uh, this uh, constant strain rate contours also. Okay. Now, what is the effect of grain size? Okay. You can also see very nicely that how the grain size affect the deformation mechanism map. Okay. So, this is for uh, 1 micron, uh, these are all for FCC nickel, nickel is an FCC material, pure nickel okay. and so this is for 1 micron, this is 10 micron, 0.1 mm means 100 micron and 1000 micron uh, 1 mm. Okay. So, grain size is increasing in this direction. So, how it affects the, the deformation mechanism map? Okay. You can see that when I have a if, if I compare with the two extreme one right now, 
Okay, you can see this is one micron and the boundary diffusion is the only one I am seeing in the diffusional flow okay. and the power law creep. Okay. Power law means where the stress or strain rate is dependent with some stress exponent. Okay. So, the equation will be something like this or we I think we used C there to the power n or m m prime let us say. Okay. So, there is a, a power law dependence. Okay. So, you have a power law creep uh, okay, in that you have low temperature creep and high temperature creep okay, and then you have diffusional flow okay, and in diffusional flow only the boundary diffusion can be seen in this particular map. Okay. For the same nickel okay, of course, all the temperature restraint rate are same because these are all normalized. If I see for 1 mm that is 1000 micron, I can see the lattice diffusion also here okay, in diffusional flow. Okay, and also the, the grain boundary diffusion is almost uh, the, there is no though no region for grain boundary diffusion. That means as I told you that coval creep dominates in the material with finer grain size because you will have more grain boundary area. So grain boundary diffusion will be more obviously. Okay, whereas uh, N, uh, NH creep okay that dominates in the coarse grain material because their grain boundaries are less okay so only the diffusion can take place through uh, through the lattice okay so you can see that the lattice diffusion field is coming here which is almost absent here and here grain boundary diffusion is absent but if you see let's say for 0.1 mm i can see both the lattice and the grain boundary diffusion in the uh, diffusional flow where the diffusional creep is taking place and also the, the size of the power law creep area is increasing. Okay. Here it was very less in the fine grain size material, but in coarse grain material the power law creep is extending up to, uh, up to a stress of I think 10 to the power minus 5, this is 10 to the power minus 5 okay, almost going up to there, whereas in this case it is almost ending at 10 to the power minus between 10 to power minus 4 to 10 to power minus 3. Okay. And it is also shifting towards the lower temperatures. Okay. At lower temperature you can start having the creep process. Okay. So, very interesting that to see the effect of microstructure on the deformation mechanism map. Okay. Of course, you should be seeing that it is only developed for pure nickel here. Okay. So, this is the effect of grain size. Okay. So, as grain size is increasing you are having lattice diffusion is coming as one of the field. Okay. Also, my power law creep area is increasing okay, in this direction. Now, this is the difference between the two different crystal structure. Okay, so, you have one tungsten which is BCC here, okay, whereas this is pure nickel, this is FCC. Okay, just to and again because I am normalizing with uh, their melting point, so I can easily compare between two deformation mechanism. F, okay, this is also normalized the stress, uh, similarly, temperature is also normalized. Okay, so, I can compare between the two. Okay, so, one thing you can see that. Uh, at lower temperature my yield stress is dependent on the uh, on the temperature you can see that there is a sharp slope here okay at at lower temperatures okay this is because of the lattice resistance to dislocation movement pulse stress okay whereas in fcc material you don't see a very strong dependence okay v very uh, sh shallow slope is there whereas in this case it was a very sharp slope. Okay. So, in BCC material the, there is a strong temperature dependence on the flow stress or the yield stress of the material. Okay. If you come to higher temperatures okay, again you have a power law creep uh, region okay, where you have low temperature and high temperature region. So, the, the area of power law creep is uh, over a one order of magnitude difference is there between uh, the strain rate. Okay, uh, here also almost it is uh, one power of uh, uh, one 
order of magnitude difference is there. Okay. Uh, the interesting part here is about the diffusional flow. Okay. You can see boundary diffusion as well as lattice diffusion in the BCC material. Okay. And lattice diffusion is starting after homologous temperature of maybe around 0 0.78 or so. Whereas, in this case you do not see any uh, lattice diffusion. Okay. This is actually the lattice diffusion which is hardly having any field here. Okay. The whole thing is boundary diffusion at 10 micron. Okay. Uh, that means, uh, there is something in the crystal structure and why BCC has more diffusion through lattice is because it has more open structure. So, diffusion through lattice is much easier uh, in case of BCC than an FCC material. FCC is, uh, is a more compact uh, atomic arrangement okay that so that effect you can see here also you can see that there are, there is one region of dynamic recrystallization is also shown, shown here another interesting thing is that you can see this uh, constant strain rate contours okay so in case of fcc material it is going uh, 10 to the power minus 10 is going up to 0.4 homologous temperature whereas uh, in case of bcc material it is going only up to 0.5 homologous temperature. So, there is effect on the response of the material also as you are changing the crystal structure. Okay. So, uh, the, the, the mechanism map will change also as a function of microstructure gradient size we have uh, just seen and also as a function of the crystal structure. Okay. Uh, some more uh, 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 modifications were tried on deformation mechanism map. Okay, uh, a very good uh, uh, source if you want on deformation mechanism map is this particular site. Okay, you can go through this site also. That you can superimpose the the forming operation on a deformation mechanism map. Okay, so you can see they have superimposed a forming operation like cold working, so explosive deformation, very high strain rate. Okay, at low temperature, then wire drawing, okay, another uh, low temperature deformation. So, all these are being done at uh, lower temperatures. Okay. Then machining, uh, this is all machining also is can be considered as one of the deformation process only. So, by deformation only you take out the chip. Okay. Then uh, you, you are coming to warm working here. Okay that means temperatures are increasing similarly hot working is there so these strain rates are more than the creep deformation okay temperatures are high but the strain rate or the flow stress if you see here is uh, more here okay whereas the creep takes place at lower uh, stresses okay and if you come to creep you have power law creep Okay. Of course, there is a power law breakdown also. So, after certain strain rate or stress, the, there will be a power law breakdown. We have seen that power law equation was only valid up to a particular uh, strain rate or stress range. After that, it was not a power law. We used uh, an exponential uh, equation for higher stresses. Okay. So, you can see there is a power law breakdown here. Okay. Below that, it is power law creep and even below that it is a diffusional creep. Okay. So, the, the material which is used for high temperature structures they are used in this range okay, where only the diffusional flow will be the important one. That means, the stresses on the components are much lower okay, so that the other deformation mechanism should not operate only diffusional flow you cannot stop if you are working on a at a higher temperature at temperatures more than 0.5 Tm. Okay. But still you can see the strain rates are very low the strain rate contours are 10 to the power minus 14 to 10 to the power minus 12 in that region. Okay. You will use the material for structural applications. So, for example, a thermal power plant the material which are used in thermal power plant or in a gas turbine the material is used in gas turbine. So, what will be the temperature that material will be used in those structural application that particular region is this one. Whereas, deformation warm working hot working will be in this region. Okay. Cold working will be even at lower temperature and higher stresses. So, 
they were also trying to superimpose the deformation processes on the processing on this deformation mechanism map. But again, please be careful, we are doing it for pure copper. Okay. Now, there was an another extension to this idea of uh, deformation mechanism map which was proposed by Ashby. Okay. You can see that only the, uh, the, the stable behaviors are shown there. For example, only uh, where there are no, uh, no defects are identified in their processing map. Okay. So, Raj uh, uh, R. Raj another researcher extended this concept of Ashby by including the, the defects or damage mechanism also in the uh, deformation mechanism maps. Okay. For example, he, he introduced the idea of cavity formation during the deformation at high temperature cavity formation is a very important uh, uh, defect which can uh, takes place. So, this cavity forms at hard particle uh, which are embedded in a soft matrix or there can be a wedge cracking at the grain boundary. Okay. Grain boundary becomes weak at high temperature. So, grain boundary separation can takes place. Okay. So, these different microstructural phenomena can be which are related to defect can be superimposed on the processing map or uh, mechan deformation mechanism map. Okay. So, this was an extension to that idea. Okay. So, this is what uh, they were trying to uh, bring out. So, you have a strain rate on the y axis and temperature on the x axis. Okay. So, different uh, uh, defects are identified for example, wedge cracking, okay. a ductile fracture of course, at low temperature uh, at sufficiently high strain rate you will have a ductile failure. Very high strain rate as I have already told you that you can have adiabatic heating. Okay, because you are not giving enough time for heat to dissipate. So, again you can see around strain rate of 1 above that the adiabatic heating will start uh, dominating or it will be a, 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 an important factor okay. and we also did uh, stress correction in the constitutive analysis only above the strain rate of 1. Then you can have dynamic crystallization which is the desired uh, microstructural change okay, which will be at higher temperature and uh, sufficiently uh, at intermediate strain rate range. Okay. So, you have failure at different level and the, this is my safe region, the dashed area is the safe region for my processing where you will not introduce any defects. Okay. So, there are couple of uh, uh, schematic is shown for the formation of cavity, uh, this, so this is my hard particle. Uh, in a soft matrix. Okay. So, when you are deforming what will happen the deformation the, because matrix is soft it will be able to deform, but the particle is uh, hard it is not going to deform. Okay. So, because of that there will be the interface uh, between the particle and uh, matrix will break uh, have a breakdown okay, and you will create cavities on both the side of the particle. So, that can happen as one of the uh, uh, defect. Another one is this wedge. Okay. So, wedge is, is a shape like this, this is a wedge. Okay. So, when you want to create uh, for example, in, in uh, when you are cutting wood, okay, you put a wedge and then you uh, hammer it, okay, so wood will open up. So, this is what you can see a shape of a wedge here on the grain boundary and that happens because of the separation of the grain boundary. So, you can see it happens at very high temperature, but relatively lower strain rates or lower stresses. Okay. So, at high temperature the grain boundaries become weak and even a small stress will be able to separate the two grains at the grain boundary and you will have a, a, a defect called wedge cracking. Okay. So, th these are the different uh, defects he superimposed on the uh, deformation mechanism map. Okay. Now, the problem with deformation mechanism map is that you have to have a very good understanding of the atomistic processes okay. uh, like what is the creep, where the creep is taking place, uh, diffusional creep, dislocation creep. So, you have to uh, for every uh, processing condition 
you have to do a very good microstructural analysis and you have to have a very well and un good understanding of the microstructures okay to understand that what type of uh, uh, process is taking place okay so you have to have a very good knowledge of uh, uh, the all these microstructural changes okay and again for a practicing engineer uh, doing all all these things will be a, uh, uh, will be too much to ask because he has to also look at the production and also as you i have told you at different places that these maps were developed only for very simple system pure materials pure copper pure nickel and so on okay because there only you can uh, ascribe or you can attribute a certain uh, uh, deformation mechanism for a particular microstructural change okay whereas if you have a complex material you have two phases you have precipitate you have solute uh, uh, solute atoms then uh, clearly identifying that which which particular uh, uh, constituent is uh, responsible for a particular uh, mechanism is very difficult okay so for complex uh, system it is difficult to attribute deformation due to one single process because there are multiple processes taking place dislocation is also there diffusion is also taking place solutes are diffusing okay and uh, precipitates are uh, doing their own business okay so th these deformation mechanism maps uh, are very useful to understand or to develop the understanding okay but it will be very difficult to apply it to uh, main engineering alloys okay and also it will be very difficult to predict uh, any processing conditions from these uh, maps okay for processing of a complex alloy okay so we will go come to the next lecture that how it was solved okay that uh, this deformation mechanism map idea was extended okay and how these particular problems were solved in the processing map which is used for hot deformation processes okay so thank you for your attention